Peter Bell, at Hale, Part 2nd, William Wordsworth, Part 2nd, we left our hero in a trance, beneath the alders, near the river. The asses by the river signed, and, where the feeble breezes glide, upon the stream the moonbeams quiver. A happy respite. But at length he feels the glimmering of the moon, wakes with glazed eve, and feebly signing to sink, perhaps, where he is lying, into a second swoon. He lifts his head, he sees his staff. He touches tis to him a treasure. Faint recollection seems to tell that he is yet where mortals dwell a thought received with languid pleasure. His head upon his elbow propped, becoming less and less perplexed, skyward he looks to rock and wood and then upon the glassy flood his wandering eye is fixed. Thought he, that is the face of one in his last sleep securely bound. So toward the stream his head he bend, and downward thrust his staff, intent the river's depth to sound. Now, like a tempest-shattered bark, that overwhelmed and prostrate lies, and in a moment to the verge is lifted of a foaming surge full suddenly the ass doth rise. His staring bones all shake with joy, and close by Peter's side he stands, while Peter o'er the river bends, the little ass's neck extends, and fondly licks his hands. Such life is in the ass's eyes, such life is in his limbs and ears, that Peter Bell, if he had been the veriest coward ever seen, must now have thrown aside his fears. The ass looks on and to his work is Peter quietly resigned. He touches here he touches there and now among the dead man's hair his sapling Peter has entwined. He pulls and looks and pulls again. And he whom the poor ass had lost, the man who had been four days dead, head foremost from the river's bed uprises like a ghost. And Peter draws him to dry land. And through the brain of Peter pass some poignant twitches, fast and faster, Amperson quo. No doubt, Amperson quo. Quoth he, Amperson quo. He is the master of this poor miserable ass. Amperson quo. The meager shadow that looks on what would he now? What is he doing? His sudden fit of joy is flown, he on his knees hath laid him down, as if he were his grief renewing. But know that Peter on his back must mount, he shows well as he can, thought Peter then, come weal or woe, I'll do what he would have me do, in pity to this poor drowned man. With that resolve he boldly mounts upon the pleased and thankful ass. And then, without a moment's stay, that earnest creature turned away leaving the body on the grass. Intent upon his faithful watch, the beast four days and nights had passed. A sweeter medinaire was seen, and there the ass four days had been nor ever once did break his fast, yet firm his step, and stat his heart. The meat is crossed the quarry's mouth is reached. But there the trusty guide into a thicket turns aside, and deftly ambles towards the south. When hark a burst of doleful sound. And Peter honestly might say, the like came never to his ears, though he has been, full thirty years, a rover night and day. Tis not a plover of the moors, tis not a bittern of the fen, nor can it be a barking fox, nor night bird chambered in the rocks, nor wild cat in a woody glen. The ass is startled and stops short right in the middle of the thicket. And Peter, wont to whistle loud whether alone or in a crowd, is silent as a silent cricket. What ails you now, my little Bess? Well may you tremble and look grave. This cry that rings along the wood, this cry that floats adown the flood, comes from the entrance of a cave. I see a blooming wood boy there, and if I had the power to say how sorrowful the wanderer is, your heart would be as sad as his till you had kissed his tears away. Grasping a hawthorn branch in hand, all bright with berries ripe and red, into the cavern's mouth he peeps. Thence back into the moonlight creeps. Whom seeks he whom? The silent dead, his father. Him doth he require him hath he sought with fruitless pains, among the rocks, behind the trees. Now creeping on his hands and knees, now running o'er the open plains. And hither is he come at last, when he through such a day has gone, by this dark cave to be distressed like a poor bird her plundered nest hovering around with dolorous moan. Of that intense and piercing cry the listening ass conjectures well. Wild as it is, he there can read some intermingled notes that plead with touches irresistible. But Peter when he saw the ass not only stop but turn, and changed the cherished tenor of his pace that lamentable cry to chase it wrought in him conviction strange. A faith that, 
for the dead man's sake and his poor slave who loved him well, vengeance upon his head will fall, some visitation worse than all which ever till this night befell. Meanwhile the ass to reach his home, is striving stoutly as he may. But, while he climbs the woody hill, the cry grows weak and weaker still. And now at last it dies away. So with his fate the creature turns into a gloomy grove of beech, along the shade with footsteps true descending slowly, till the two the open moonlight reach. And there, along the narrow dell, a fair smooth pathway you discern, a length of green and open road as if it from a fountain flowed winding away between the fern. The rocks that tower on either side build up a wild fantastic scene. Temples like those among the Hindus, and mosques, and spires, and abbey windows, and castles all with ivy green. And, while the ass pursues his way, along the solitary dell, as pensively his steps advance, the mosques and spires change countenance and look at Peter Bell. That unintelligible cry hath left him high in preparation, convinced that he, or soon or late, this very night will meet his fate and so he sits in expectation. The strenuous animal hath come with the green path. And now he wends where, shining like the smoothest sea, in undisturbed immensity a level plain extends. But whence this faintly rustling sound by which the journeying pair are chased? A withered leaf is close behind, light plaything for the sport of wind upon that solitary waste. When Peter spied the moving thing, it only doubled his distress. And person quo. Where there is not a bush or tree, the very leaves they follow me so huge hath been my wickedness. And person quo. To a close lane they now are come, where, as before, the enduring ass moves on without a moment's stop, nor once turns round his head to crop a bramble leaf or a blade of grass. Between the hedges as they go, the white dust leaps upon the lane. And Peter, ever and anon back looking, sees, upon a stone, or in the dust, a crimson stain. A stain as of a drop of blood by moonlight made more faint and wan. Hectares. Why these sinkings of despair? He knows not how the blood comes there and Peter is a wicked man. At length he spies a bleeding wound, where he had struck the ass's head. He sees the blood, knows what it is, a glimpse of sudden joy was his, but then it quickly fled. Of him whom sudden death had ceased he thought, of thee, O faithful ass. And once again those ghastly pains, shoot to and fro through heart and reins, and through his brain like lightning pass, 